good day and welcome to the web panel combating anti-semitism with jewish heritage <coughs> resources my name is andrea spindle i'm the executive director of the canadian anti-semitism education foundation which is a registered charity based in toronto our focus is on education about anti-semitism and its latest iteration anti-zionism we work to counter the narrative the dishonest narrative about israel and to provide historical and legal truths about the rights of Jews to the land of Israel, beginning with international resolutions in 1920 that led to the reestablishment of the State of Israel. One of our major goals is to see the bigoted and potentially dangerous Israel Apartheid Week end on campuses across this country. Our goal today is to raise awareness of Jewish Heritage Month in Canada and consider its purpose and the impact that this opportunity presents. In addition to countering anti-Semitism, we see it as an opportunity to do what Elan Carr, the special envoy for combating and monitoring anti-Semitism in the US, has recommended. He suggests that we also build philo-Semitism and build pride among young Jews in their Judaism and Zionism and help them to develop the capacity to stand up against anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Each of our panelists will have a few minutes to introduce their respective programs. They are all working in this field. I will then pose questions and invite a response from individual panelists. I will attempt to ensure that each panelist has an opportunity to respond. And then we will take questions that you will be able to um, pose um, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I will read the questions and individual panelists can respond. I also want to point out that if you want to see um, everyone at the same time, if you're not familiar with Zoom, there is a gallery view and you'll see all of the uh, panels at the same time, though the focus will be on each as they speak respectively. respectively. I'm now going to introduce your panelists. <coughs> oh, we've got, uh, they're in a sequence in my notes, it's different, so let me move. Okay, <laughs> Shari Schwartz-Maltz, the Manager of Media Relations and Issues Management for the Toronto District School Board. She's also chair of the TDSB's Jewish Heritage Committee, which I understand now has over 75 participants. The TDSB is the largest school board in Canada with almost 600 schools and 250,000 students. So there's a potential to have a huge impact. Uh, next, we have Leora Schaefer, the executive director of Facing History and Ourselves Canada. In her role, Leora oversees the development and implementation of professional development opportunities for teachers, curricular initiatives and educational events for the greater community. She facilitates workshops and seminars for educators on teaching practice and pedagogy and is passionate about her work. Nicole Miller is the executive director of FAST, an organization that stands for Fighting Anti-Semitism Together. Her childhood in South Africa led her to become a champion of human rights. As a graduate from McGill University and Parsons School of Design, Nicole lived and studied in many countries and worked as the creative director in New York and Toronto. For almost 12 years at FAST, she's been committed to providing educational resources to combat anti-Semitism, hate, and all forms of intolerance. And Corey Margulies, a teacher for 12 years with the York Board of Education, taught many subjects, He's a site principal for Torah High, co-chair of the Education Committee for Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, and co-chair of the Network of Educators Supporting Jewish Learners in York Region. He's the founder of jteach.ca and a trainer in countering anti-Semitism. And he emphasized to me, he's also a husband and father. So I will now ask each of our speakers to give us a moment to describe their program. Why don't I do this first now, Corey? Would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I started jteach.ca as a response to seeing a lot of, uh, of young people who were really having issues with connecting with their Jewish identities. Um, while they recognized themselves as Jewish and they were part of the community at large, they really had a hard time narrowing down what that means in part of, of their Jewish identity and who they are as a person. Uh, combine that with the instances over the last few years of anti-Semitism, and I really felt like there needed to be something to be done. Uh, I know there are many, many organizations out there that do an amazing jobs 
of Holocaust education, anti-Semitism education, but you know, I figured the more the better. Um, so I really started focusing on elementary and high school age students and teachers. Um, I help uh, teachers to develop their own programs to address Holocaust education or anti-Semitism in their classes. I go around to schools and I do presentations on the Holocaust or anti-Semitism in order to help many students in the public school system understand the seriousness of it and how to um, work issues out without getting into confrontational situations. And um, I have a website and a podcast where um, we just discuss things that connect to the Jewish world and hopefully pe help people to connect to their Jewish traditions, religion, cultures uh, in a positive way. Okay, thank you. Leora. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you for the, the invitation. This is a really interesting conversation. Um, uh, just, I hope that throughout this time together, you'll have a better, more opportunities to really get a deeper understanding of facing history in ourselves. But to begin, um, we are an organization that has been around for over 40 years, globally started in the US. Our organization here in Canada has been around for over 10 years. Um, and as an organization, we believe strongly that education, um, specifically learning about the past, is the way that we will work to reduce rates of bigotry, hate, anti-Semitism specifically. Um, and in that time when we began as an organization, although we now have developed additional case studies looking at different historical pasts, um, but we began, our origin is through looking at the history of the Holocaust. Um, and our approach is unique in that not only do we want to learn about the past, but the reason to do so is to mobilize and empower young people to recognize that they have opportunities, they have agency to create change and stand up for what they see as being wrong, recognize when their um, moral compass is being pushed up against um, and recognizing that they have tools, that they have those, those opportunities. Um, we have been, over those 10 years, we actually began working um, in partnership with TDSB on a course called Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity. Um, and that was really a, a foundational experience for us. Since then, we are now working across Canada in school boards across the country and we reach through teachers, through professional development and support to educators. We reach hundreds of thousands of students now across the country each year. Um, so that's, yeah, that's where we are in, in this conversation. Thank you. Um, Sherry, would you like to go next? So I'm very privileged to work for the TDSB, the Toronto District School Board, which is the largest school board in Canada, I think in the top five of North America. And as Andrea pointed out, we have almost 600 schools, 250,000 students. My day job is manager of media and issues management for the board. Um, my labor of love is chair of the Jewish Heritage Committee of the TDSB. We really got the committee going about five years ago. Um, it's been around longer than that, but it sort of really got going about five years ago. And I'm proud to say that today we have almost 75 educators on the committee who are deeply committed uh, to um, teaching and learning. That's our complete focus, teaching and learning in the TDSB of uh, everything Jewish heritage. So we've done all kinds of fantastic programs. Um, one of the most exciting programs we did was two years ago, we did Kensington walking tours for kids uh, with a Jewish focus in partnership with UJA Archives and uh, almost 4,000 kids from right across the GTA, I would say 99% not Jewish, um, got the chance to go through Kensington Market uh, during Jewish Heritage Month. That's just one example of our, of our programs and it was an unbelievable experience. So we do a lot of different programming. Uh, this year was a special year for us in honor of Liberation 75. We did actually not just Jewish Heritage Month, we did a full year of Holocaust and genocide prevention education. Again, all supported by our incredible team of 75 educators, which range from trustees, superintendents, teachers, principals. Uh, so it's a very exciting committee, very committed to teaching and learning. Great. Um, I'd like to call on Nicole, but I'm not seeing Nicole on my screen. Nic is Nicole there? There you are. Okay, good. <laughs> 
So to give some background about FAST, um, Tony Comber is past president and CEO of the Bank of Montreal. And he and his late wife, Elizabeth, a former teacher, founded FAST in response to a wave of anti-Semitic incidents happening in 2004. And as non-Jews, they believe the battle against rising anti-Semitism, the oldest hatred in history, is one for non-Jews to solve. So along with the coalition of other non-Jewish business and community leaders, FAST was established to fund educational programs to fight all intolerance with an emphasis on anti-Semitism, hence fighting anti-Semitism together with non-Jews. Since 2005, FAST has provided bilingual teaching resources at no cost and now entirely online through school boards, teacher federations and associations at conferences and board workshops. When invited, we also go into high schools and present to all the staff, for example, at Forest Hill and John Polanyi Collegiates. But in reality, the online resources are so user-friendly and easy for teachers to plan lessons and just run with them. So to date, we've reached over 4 million students in every province and territory. Um, developed by experts at OISV, U of T, to meet curriculum requirements, Choose Your Voice is aimed at grades 6 to 8, and Voices into Action for 9 to 12, as well as being taught in post-secondary institutions. Both programs, I'm proud to say, won awards of excellence from the Canadian Race Relations Foundation in 2010 and again in 2016. The Holocaust features prominently throughout our two programs, approximately one third of the content. By using a Canadian lens to explore all genocides, racism and oppression toward other minorities, such as the indigenous experience, students begin to understand parallels between them, between them and that of Jews. 15 years ago, we filmed interviews with Holocaust survivors, still a key part of Choose Your Voice. There are 36 video interviews in Voices Into Action, including Ben Mulroney introducing the program, Erwin Kotler on human rights, Daniel Liebeskin on monuments and museums, Adam McGuire on the Armenian genocide, just to name a few. And for Jewish Heritage Month, we intentionally developed a huge lesson and chapter in Voices Into Action called Judaism and Antisemitism Through the Ages. We feel that one cannot begin to understand anti-Semitism without some knowledge of Judaism. Through critical thinking and many different kinds of activities or actions, students are introduced to the rich life of Judaism presented in a very factual, objective manner. They learn about beliefs, sects, population data, the Jewish calendar, holidays, dietary requirements, so much more. Essentially a Judaism 101 intro course. And then this is followed by a brief history up to the Second World War of Jews in Europe and the US. And what most people don't know is about the first Jews in Canada. And finally, a summary of the types of historical anti-Semitism leading up to the Holocaust, religious and racial, exploring ongoing anti-Semitic tropes, protocols of Zion, for example. And then present day anti-Semitism along with Holocaust denial is found in a very different unit, contemporary anti-Semitism in uh, unit six. As you can see, there's a wealth of information for teachers to use. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Okay, I'm going to start with questions. I'll direct my first question to Leora. Um, my understanding is from various polls that I've read about that actually in Canada, very, the majority of young people, about 60% have indicated that they don't know much about the Holocaust. And um, we know that there is a lot of anti-Semitism on campuses. So at an academic institution, we know that there's a lot of anti-Semitism that's expressed through anti-Israel activities. Can you talk about how the program that you offer um, can confront this and how effective are we in our teaching of history and the Holocaust given this disproportionate um, disproportionate ignorance, I guess I would suggest, yeah. notwithstanding Jewish Heritage Month? So I think there's there's a lot in that question that you're asking. Um, I think part of the, let me first say that these are troubling statistics. We, we've seen them, um, not only have we seen them, you know, released through the Israeli Foundation, but then they were recently replicated um, with uh, friends of Simon Wiesenthal. So we're paying attention to these numbers. Um, I, I think that there is a, there is great value and importance to not only the dates and times and places, right? Students need to know about the Holocaust, um, but more so they need to know about why are we studying this? 
Um, and so, you know, when I read those, that data, while I am deeply troubled to read that, you know, young people, millennials don't know what Auschwitz is or do not know that six million people were murdered, Jew Jewish people were murdered. Um, I'm, I'm more deeply concerned about what that means for, for their actions. So what does that mean when they see rising rates of anti-Semitism today? Are those same young people thinking that this is, this is in a bubble. This has never happened before. What we are seeing is new. And, and therefore, um, you know, well, I, I don't have to do anything about it. You know, that could be one, res one end result. So what we encourage our students and our teachers to do is really understand, um, first of all, you know, what is, the Holocaust did not start in 1933 when the Holocaust, when the Nazis came to power. It did not start at, when, you know, when the final solution, you know, scholars debate when this starts. What we really need to do is go back and understand the history of anti-Semitism. As we are studying the history of anti-Semitism, students also have to understand the recurring themes that we see emerging. And as we see, and as we learn, we also have to recognize moments where people stood up, where people advocated, where people rescued. And those stories and those moments that students learn about the ways that, that we can get involved and prevent and, and act in, on behalf of is very important. And so, um, you know, there, one of the things that I want to make sure that we talk about today is that, you know, facing history is really in the business of creating allies. No group of people want to feel that they are always standing up for themselves, that they are out there on their own. Um, and what we see through data in our, when we look at our facing history classes is not only are our students, so that, you know, what we see goes against the, the national findings, which is both rewarding and it also just means that we need to be in more classrooms. So what we see when we, when we collect data on our facing history classrooms is that 81% of those students say that they recognize anti-Semitism and prejudice in the world around them, that they can call it out and name it. And that same group of students have higher rates, 87% of those students feel that they have the tools to stand up. And so when I see those two numbers together, what I see are those are allies. Those are the students that are going off onto campus. And so not only do they know if you should ask them, you know, what, how many Jew, Jewish people were murdered in the Holocaust or name concentration camps, they'll retain that information because they learned it in a meaningful way, but they also then have the capacity to stand up and say, that when we, and I think this will be continued in the conversation, so I'll end by saying those are the same students that recognize that what we see today, we should not be surprised. It's devastating, but we see these repeated moments. We see these repeated tropes. We see these repeated themes emerging over and over again. And so it's with that understanding that these same students have the tools to fight it. Thank you. That leads me actually to into the next question that I want to direct to Shari. And that is, obviously, Jewish Heritage Month is a focus. It gives us an opportunity to think about all the things that Leora just mentioned. But I appreciated that you said this was a year of thinking about uh, the liberation, um, the end of, of the Holocaust. Can you comment on how you see the preparation that uh, you're imparting to students positively impacting what goes on at universities? Do you know, is there any way of tracking that this information then is doing what Leora hopes it does, which is preparing kids to stand up and hold others accountable if they run into anti-Semitism. Because presumably by it being in the public system, you're affecting a lot of people. And since we know the universities, they're not dominated by anti-Semitism, but there are events that dominate that are anti-Semitic. Will this counter that? Do you think it'll bring about a change at the university level? Well, I certainly hope it brings about a change at the university level, but we don't have any data. Um, I mean, our kids, just the sheer number of graduates from TDSB and they go to multiple universities. But what we did this year, I think was exceptional. I mean, we talk about Jewish Heritage Month. We really at the TDSB had Jewish Heritage Year this year with our focus. This was our first year of 
the five years I've been chair that we really focused on Holocaust and genocide prevention education. And again, it was in support of Liberation 75. So just to give you an example of two programs we did, which I mean, the volume of kids, the number of kids that, that were involved with this was astonishing to me. Um, thanks to a very generous donation from Indigo, from Heather Reisman, we were able to give 18,000 kids in TDSB, every single kid in grade six got a copy of, in my opinion, one of the best books there is for kids on the Holocaust, and that is Hannah's Suitcase. Beautiful story. Um, consider that. Every single kid in grade six read Hannah's Suitcase this year. And even though we were supposed to bring in, uh, if you know the story, uh, it's about a Japanese archivist who finds a suitcase. True story. We were supposed to bring her in from Tokyo. Of course, all of this got canceled because of, of the pandemic. But even online today, teachers are still using it, still using it uh, in lit literature projects and social studies projects and history and art. I see it because they send me a lot of the kids' work. So that's, that's a tremendous accomplishment. I think, and this is just one of many, many things we've done this year. Uh, for high school, we partnered with the Shoah Foundation in Los Angeles, and we were the first school, we are the first school board to pilot um, the Shoah Foundation's virtual reality film on uh, Pinchas Guter's Return to Maidanic, The Last Goodbye. And we did an entire installation at Oakwood Collegiate, bringing field trips in to see the virtual reality film. And there's also, there was also an art installation uh, on the Holocaust. And had we been able to continue it to the end, it was four months, uh, we would have had almost 5,000 kids from right across the GTA. And, and largely, I might add, I mean, our Jewish population in TDSB is very small. So these are all, this is all new to, to, to all these kids. So okay. I'm extremely proud of, of what we've done. And those are two very small examples of, of the commitment the board made this year. So, you. I, you know, you're asking me about university. I, I don't know, but all I know is uh, we're doing a lot at the board. Maybe that's a good research project for someone to it pick is. up and track <laughs> the impact. Um, I have a question for you, Corey. Um, one of the um, misconceptions, prejudices that is uh, espoused against Jews is that uh, we are European. We are, like, that's a bad thing. You've come from Europe, you're white, you're a colonialist. The truth is the Jews come in all colors. And there are many degrees of religious observance. There are many ethno-racial uh, communities. Uh, we are in every country in the world and in all those places, Jews um, look and act like the people there. So my question to you is how important is the teaching of Jewish diversity, if at all, in your teaching about Jewish culture and the contributions of Jews to the world, to Canada? Well, kind of like the other questions, I think that's also a big question, um, but we're here to answer big questions, aren't we? Um, like you said, Judaism, I mean, Judaism obviously started as a religion. It's a monotheistic religion. It's the first monotheistic religion, um, but not everybody identifies that way with their own Judaism. There's Jews who identify through their traditions. They identify through their culture spiritually. Um, they do identify through their religion. But when people, like you said, when people think about Jewish people, they tend to think about white European immigrants from those parts of the world, Poland, Russia, Germany. Uh, and that's not always the case. The truth is there's Jews from many corners of the world. There's black Jews, there's Asian Jews, there's Indian Jews. Um, there, there's Jews from far and wide across the planet. And as you mentioned, there's also a variance in how Jewish people choose to practice uh, their own Judaism. So how important is it to understand this? It's extremely important. Um, you know, the rest of the country really needs to recognize that there's as much diversity within the Jewish community, within the Jewish people, as there are in Canada. And just as there's such a diversity amongst the Jewish people, there's tremendous diversity in the contributions that Jews make to Canada as a whole and to the world. So, you know, it's, it's not so easy when those point to the Jews and say, you know, it's the Jews' fault, uh, because truly we're part of every aspect of society and we contribute positively to every aspect of society and then and, and from each and every direction. We, we can't be pigeonholed into one specific type of person in one specific type of area of the city and one socioeconomical class. 
because the Jews are spread far and wide amongst all of them. You know, something unique about the Jews when we talk about immigration is that we didn't immigrate from countries where we were the dominant religion, where we were the dominant culture. We came from all over the world in all different communities where we were always the minority and we chose to live in Canada. We choose to live in the United States because we want to be part of that community. So while we still maintain our own sense of religion, our own sense of, sense of culture, um, we also choose to contribute positively to where we live. And that, that you know, is, is just enhanced by the diversity within the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nicole, um, you had sent me an email um, a week or two ago that, that intrigued me about how um, Israel is introduced. So my question to you, that is in your program, if education is a cure or an antidote to anti-Semitism, what do you feel are the most important elements that need to be taught? Well, um, hold on one second. Uh, and I threw in Israel because you addressed it as something that's actually part of your program. On the other hand, I will for, I'll first address the Israel part because there's different uh, things in your question. So it's a very contentious and difficult topic that is too challenging for a lot of teachers to introduce in their classrooms. And I've found that most educators will tend to stay away from teaching about any unresolved conflicts, particularly when they may have both Jewish and Muslim students in the same classroom. So we always believe the solution is to teach students to use reliable sources for all their information, and especially online where fake news is so prevalent. And rather than getting into debate about the whole Israel-Palestine conflict, encouraging students to use critical thinking. My own personal belief is that outside of the classroom, like even when adult non-Jews want to discuss Israel, that Jews can help them understand that Canadian Jews, as Corey was saying, chose Canada as their home over Israel. They can still love Israel, feel a connection to it without loving the government and its policies or choosing to live there. Um, yet, anti-Semitism is at the root of the scapegoating that Israel has endured, despite being the only democracy in the region. So it's really important for non-Jews to recognize that. And in my experience, non-Jews who have visited Israel can't help falling in love with it while recognizing the challenges faced by the country. So if more trips to Israel for non-Jewish Canadians could be subsidized, I, I think that would go very far to developing greater understanding. But again, as I said, in the classroom, especially where you have children from various backgrounds who um, you know, are recent immigrants, it can be a very touchy subject. Um, but by teaching what, you know, Jewish Heritage Month is, an, is a supposed to be a celebration and shouldn't really focus completely on the negative. So if you can, in, if teachers can introduce all the positive aspects of Judaism, not just their contributions, but looking at uh, Jewish heritage, current events, and, um, looking at culture, art, literature, foods, traditions. Um, and our program usage demonstrates that teachers are using it in many classes in addition to history, for example, English, French, the arts, and pretty much all social sciences and social studies classes. So a few great ways I suggest to celebrate Canadian Jews would be to expose students to Leonard Cohen's music and poetry, for example. Read books by Mordechai Richler or a few renowned Yiddish writers. Learn about noted Canadian Jewish artists in our class, like, uh, such as Charles Pachter. So there, there are many ways on top of just identifying Jews by Holocaust and anti-Semitism. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> That's great. My questions are intended to be big ones. Um, so Leora, for you. Um, I don't know if there's one, there's not a right answer, obviously, but what's your thought about what grade or age level is it most important to target with programs about Jews, Judaism, and at what age would you introduce anti-Semitism? So I think that there's sort of, there's two parts to that question. One, I feel far more um, prepared to, or professionally that um, to, to respond to. Um, you know, I think that anti-Semitism and the Holocaust is best understood when students are developmentally prepared to understand several pieces. Most importantly, historical chronology, um, how and when things happen. And, and we know that from developmental psychologists that that really happens 
in sort of upper middle school, middle school age and continues to develop. And so there's a very good reason why, for example, grade 10 history in Ontario, which is where the Holocaust really is prominently featured, um, it's a perfectly placed curricular choice. This is when students are prepared developmentally to understand when things happen and how one piece is connected to the next. Um, the, the, a different, and also uh, when, when we're thinking about young children, you know, understanding that something that happened in the past does not necessarily mean that it's happening to me, um, that I am not personally at, in danger. That being said, what young people have is a real understanding of fairness and right and wrong and when and how to stand up for things. And so you don't wanna shy away from everything altogether and, and paint a rosy picture because young kids really understand what it means to stand up for somebody, for a neighbor, for example, or to stand up to a bully or to stand up for um, what's right and fair. Um, and so it's how you have the conversations. So a conversation about the Holocaust and genocide needs to happen when young people are older and Facing History works with really middle school and high school age students across curricular areas, even though our entry point is history. And then the conversation in your question is about when does one learn about Judaism? In, again, I'll answer from sort of my entry point. It is not and I will, I will bring in Doris Bergen, Dr. Doris Bergen, who is a foremost scholar of Holocaust. Um, and she says, you know, we don't learn anything about Jewish people or Judaism from studying the Holocaust. And especially in the context of a conversation around Jewish Heritage Month, it's critical that we, we make that very clear, that what we learn about Jewish people when we study genocide and the Holocaust is we learn the perspective of the perpetrators of Jewish people. And so in fact, if that's the entry point, if that's what young people are learning about Jewish people, that's highly, highly problematic stereotype. I mean, you, can, you know what, what then you would be taking away. And so even as young people study in a high school, middle school, high school age, and they start learning about the Holocaust, we believe very strongly that you need to understand something about Judaism. You have to understand something about the evolution of Judaism. You have to understand about what life before the war is. At, at, you know, what did that look like? The vibrancy of Jewish life, the diversity, the same diversity that Corey so beautifully spoke about existed in Europe and in Northern Africa, right? These are the Jews. It's not a singular sort of fiddler on the roof stereotype that we're talking about. Um, and so I think that it is perfectly, and I would turn to my um, colleagues on the panel to speak about the younger ages, particularly Corey may have a lot to say about this, but I would imagine and I would feel strongly that in fact it's perfectly reasonable in our diverse classrooms in this province and across the country for kids to be learning about Judaism. In fact, I would really hope that young people are learning about Judaism and what it means to be a Jewish person from a much, much younger age. But when we're talking about persecution and genocide, that needs to happen far later. Is it possible that we just lost our moderator? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> oh dear. Corey, what do you think about this? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, let me, while we're, while we're yeah. trying to fix that on the that assumption of broadcasting, um, <laughs> you mentioned the younger ages, and I have to tell you that, um, when I present to grade fives and sixes, I get some of, because you talked about their honesty and their ability to understand. Yeah. And when I talk to them, I talk to them from the perspective, when I tell them about Holocaust education, I tell them these are my experiences, this is what I connect to because I happen to be Jewish and my family, some of my mm -hmm. family went through the Holocaust and this is my experience. I said, but you can apply this towards, really towards anything that has to do with hate. This is what happens when, you, when, when hate is allowed to run unchecked. And I always put that out there for them and I get the nods and I get the questions at the end from students who are not Jewish and some of the most brilliant questions and innocent questions that you don't get from the adults. And uh, at the end, I tell them, I give them homework. And it's like you said, I say to them, you, each and every one of you now has homework. You need to stand up every time you hear an injustice. 
Since you don't need to put yourself in danger, if you don't feel comfortable confronting it yourself, there's teachers around, there's parents around, there's friends who are around who will do it for you or with you. But when you see something that's wrong, when you see something perpetrated against someone that shouldn't be happening, you need to stand up and say something. You need to be part of the solution. And, and you know, and it goes back to, you mentioned yeah. Doris Bergen. I mean, it goes back to her, you know, classifying the bystanders and the upstanders and the victims and the perpetrators and how, you know, think about, although we had many people who were, um, you know, who were allies in, in the Holocaust and who were mm -hmm. righteous among the nation and who helped many, many Jews escape death. Um, there were many who could have done much more and didn't because they just didn't know how or didn't have a true understanding of what was going on. So part of our job, I think, is really to make people understand this is what went on and we never want to go down that path again. Right. I'm sorry, folks, that I got bumped out. I don't know what happened, but I'm the least techy person here, so that's what okay. happened. We Thank kept the story. conversation going. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to throw this question at Nicole. Um, you spoke about the uh, difficulty of speaking about Israel, um, or that it's a sensitive issue, I guess is the way you worded it, with regard to educators. However, it is a very a uh, substantial part of um, the Jewish world. So can you give us an idea of how you would introduce it? Uh, and maybe because Jewish Heritage Month is more than just a program for schools, it is presumably all of society. Are there ways in which it should be discussed or described that help everybody to understand how it fits in with Jewish life? That's a big question. Maybe you can give me some thoughts about it. I, I will say, Andrea, it's only consists of about 2% of our entire um, program. So both of them, uh, there's not much about it in Choose Your Voice for grades six, seven, and eight, and only the smallest bit in contemporary anti-Semitism, because as I've said, it's very contentious. And I know for a fact from school boards that uh, and they, um, they don't wanna touch it. And so I think that the goal is rather to help them understand Judaism, I, this is, you know, my understanding is we're talking about Jewish Heritage Month and how Canadians will celebrate it. And if you start venturing into Israel, even Jews among themselves are so divided on the topic. Um, and we do call ourselves a human rights organization. And, and it's so it's, um, it's tough and we, and we really tried to stay out of the conversation. So what we did though is we went to an expert, um, Professor Erwin Kotler, who did, provided a great video for us that gave some insight and does go a little bit into BDS. Um, and he, he talks about Israel's right to exist even if you don't, other countries don't agree with a particular government's policies that uh, should a country cease to exist? No, of course not. Um, but that's his objective perspective, and we included it because um, you know he's so well revered and respected, and he even has his own human rights organization, the Raoul Wallenberg Human Rights Center in Montreal. But we we don't enter it in, into into that much, other than um, you know we go into uh, incidents that happened around the world um, with respect to anti-Semitism but we, we don't talk about the Israel-Palestine conflict. Well, let me just frame it differently for all of you and see if any of you want to address this. The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, which has been adopted by 33 countries, including Canada, is very specific that there are some uh, ways of thinking about Israel or being against Israel that are indeed anti-Semitic. If anti-Semitism is on the rise, it's primarily around anti-Israelism, and, um, and it's not just about the conflict, it's about, as you've said, Nicole, Israel's even right to exist. And the definition says, if you don't believe the Jews have the right to have a, a country, that is anti-Semitic. So I'm interested in any one of you answering, how can you not reference IHRA if you're dealing with the topic anti-Semitism? Would you not have to? And would that not lead you to that conversation about Israel's rights? Anybody wanna? I, I mean, I can, so, Corey, did you want to go? 
I'll, I can I can be relatively quick. Um, I, I think that what is important is to really name things properly um, and use the proper terms and understand what we are saying. So you you've we've talked about this. You know, one can critique Israel. Yes. And Israel, not, I mean, one can critique choices that Israeli, the government is making. And we can be quite divided uh, as, as, as Jews in Canada about that. Where there's a line is, on, is when, you, when people are saying that Israel does not have a right to exist. And so anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are very closely, I mean, they, they are one in the same. And again, like, you know, I talked about trope, I talked about themes, you see the same images, you hear the same kinds of languages when you hear Israel being vilified. Um, as we we see in you know Der Sturmer and the you know these same ways of thinking depictions we see them repeating um, and and yet the problem that we see in our schools which has also been a recurring theme this afternoon is that we're not able to actually feel that we can build spaces to have these conversations and so when teach when educators don't feel that they are they have the tools or that they're safe. We, we all would do the same. You just don't touch it, don't go there. And so one of the things that Facing History is really, um, we, we try to be at the forefront in supporting teachers is how to have civil discourse. So in those classrooms that Nicole described, how are we having conversations? How are we speaking and listening to one another and referencing appropriately and being very careful and naming things properly when something is anti-Zionism, when something is anti-Semitism, and when something is honest and fair critique of policy in the same way that we would critique Canadian policy, right? So, right. Be, and, and, and there's a lot of front loading and a lot of space creating so that students, when that happens, it's not like something happens and then you're gonna, oh, let's roll it back and let's create safe space and let's create a classroom where we can have civil discourse. That needs to be there right in the beginning. That's what's happening in the very first part of the school year. So when these moments emerge, because in the best classrooms they do, the classroom is prepared to have those conversations. Sounds like you've been reading John Haidt on civil discourse. <laughs> now, listen, it's, our, it's the work and it's so important. We live in these bubbles. Yes. We, we live in these spaces where we hear news that we want to hear, we, we curate our messages, and so when do we have the opportunity to actually practice civil discourse in our in our day-to-day? -day? But it happens in our classrooms. Sorry, Corey, you were going to say something. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I agree very much with what you said. I, I mean, obviously we know that anti-Zionism is the not so, so new anymore form of anti-Semitism where, um, you know, there's being hatred and there's being accusations directed at the Jewish people of Israel um, yeah. and the right for, not for necessarily for Israel to exist, but for Israel to exist as a Jewish country. I think that's the crux of a lot of people's argument. And it really, uh, it should be a political conversation, a political discussion, not one based on religion or culture. So, and the problem in the schools is like you said, teachers are afraid to touch the subject because they're afraid of, how to deal with it. But I think that fear comes from the top down. And I'm not laying blame on anyone specific, but I think that it's not just the teachers, but it's the school system in general that doesn't really want to get into that kind of an argument because they're not sure they're gonna handle it properly and they're gonna offend someone. The only, which I understand, I understand that wholeheartedly. You have to present both sides of an argument if you wanna look at it, if you wanna discuss it. The problem really comes about where um, all of these myths or all of these lies or all of these half-truths are being perpetuated, discussed in schools, even if it's not you know, by the teachers or the staff, but the kids are talking about it. And the more they talk about it, the more they perpetuate these, these fantasies and people start to believe it. So at some point, it is the responsibility of educators to provide the other side and to give a balanced approach so that people can have the tools to at least make the, their own decision and not just do something because their father or a celebrity or their friend said, this is the way it should be. You know, and it really comes back to that critical thinking aspect of skills. We, we talk about it, we talk about giving people the tools to do it, and then we forget all about the fact that there's tons of confirmation bias out there mm -hmm. and that they're already coming in with opinions, learned opinions from, from elsewhere that say to them, no, this is the truth, not what you're telling me. 
Okay, thank you. I have a question for Sherry that's come in from um, one of our attendees. And I have to say to the attendees that had less, had um, already uh, given me questions that when I got bumped out, that they all fell out. So please type them again. But I have a, a question here. Uh, the union movement, not many unions, not all, but the teachers union and other unions like the postal union have expressed anti-Semitism in their focus on the Palestinians and portrayed Israel in a negative light. How can teachers deal with this? How should teachers deal with it if the union, I guess, has a particular perspective? Where's Sherry? Sherry? Can you see me? No. Can everybody oh, else see me? you are. Yeah. Uh, that's not something I've really had to face in my job, to be honest with you. Um, if teacher unions have expressed those opinions, I guess they have in a central way. It certainly doesn't, um, I haven't seen it trickle down. I'm gonna be honest with you. I just haven't. Does that answer? So that's question? a positive. There was an issue that I thought I would raise with you and that was the, um, tw in 2018 when during Jewish Heritage Month at um, uh, Forest Hill Collegiate, the Jewish kids put up a banner that was celebrating Jewish Heritage Month. And one or more students, I guess, complained to the administration because it had the blue, it was blue and white and had a star on it. And the school moved that banner to the library and Jewish parents objected. It was eventually moved back to a more public space. The Toronto board, I understand, may have even apologized for what happened, but it does raise uh, the question as to why the administration would have responded like that in the first instance. And is there any, are there any consequences when something like that happens? I don't think there's any ever any consequences when someone makes a genuine human mistake, right? It was a new principal. She was new to the school, new to the community. Uh, she had, uh, there were voices who are often silent um, that came to her and expressed some discomfort with the, with the, uh, with the flag being there. But, uh, um, you know, yes, she made a decision and she acknowledged after that what she should have done is brought all the parties together and have a have a conversation with all the parties as to why certain elements of the student population felt discomfort with it and why it was so important to another percentage of the population. That didn't happen. She apologized. We brought in resources to bring people together and it was resolved. Are there ongoing sessions for teachers? if they want, never, uh, not just if they want to do Jewish Heritage Month, but for dealing with this type of conflict, I don't know if it's a conflict, but disagreement, are there, are there seminars and workshops for teachers around how to deal with those things? What disagreement over what? Well, I'm saying here you had a situation where one group of students was portraying something and another group or individuals objected. Do, are, is the administration supposed to act on that objection or are there ways, like you just said, to bring people together? I mean, that's what principals do, right? We have equity advisors, we have an equity department. Um, there's lots of- But that didn't happen until there was an objection raised. That's why I'm asking. Right, because as I explained, she was a new principal in a new community um, and um, that's what happened, right? But it was rectified. Uh, you know, honestly, uh, I've, I've been around at the board for 12 years when uh, certain things like this come up, they're usually resolved at the local level, right? And equity advisors come in, um, superintendents assist. I've often gone involved in situations um, and it gets resolved at the local level. I mean, this, this right. that was an anomaly in my opinion. And Actually, can I add? Wanna, go ahead, go ahead, Nicole. They called me in to present a workshop to the entire staff everybody not just the teachers and that way provided the tools that the teachers needed to work with their individual classes classes and deal with it and so, Nicole, Nicole brings up a good point actually I forgot that um, when we had we've had graffiti situations at some of our schools um, we, which we deem as hate crimes and sometimes they're anti-Semitic, sometimes they're Islamophobic, they can be homophobic, but there's been quite, there have been quite a few anti-Semitic graffiti situations. And in my opinion, I usually know about them instantly because of my issues side of my job as well. 
but what I like about what we do is we don't just, you know, we do report it and we have a system in place where we document it. We phone the police, we, we keep, we, we've started to keep statistics. Um, principals have to fill out a form, it gets documented. But we've, um, thanks to my friend Nicole at FAST and uh, Azrieli, we've brought in educators who are specialists in, in, in these areas into the schools. Um, and done programs with the kids on what happened outside on the building and what does that mean? Because again, to me, everything, all, all that matters is teaching and learning, right? One of the uh, comments you made early on, Sherry, was that there aren't that many Jewish kids in the system, right? Yeah. And, that's, and it's true at the university level too. I did a count. I went and looked at every single Canadian university and how many undergrads were Jewish. And across the country, there's only 20,000. So when you read about instances of anti-Semitism, you have to wonder who they're targeting. And many campuses have Israel Apartheid Week, but they don't have Jews and they don't have Israelis and they don't have any background. So my, my next question really to any of you is, if there's, um, I mean, would teachers that don't have a Jewish kid present even want to do Jewish Heritage Month? Why would they value it? Why would it present an opportunity to them if they've never had a Jewish kid in the class? That's why the programming that we do or that I'm that my committee puts together is of interest and not just the Jewish kids. In fact, I'm going to be honest with you, for the most part, what, what we really what we really try to emphasize is programming at our non Jewish population. So if I take our Kensington Market walking tours, what kid wouldn't want to walk through Kensington Market in the spring in May? you know, did, did they really care that it was Jewish Heritage Month? No, they got to go on a walking th tour through a, a fun a marketplace filled with all kinds of interesting things. But at the same time, we took them into the synagogue. Uh, we hired an actor. Um, this was through our partnership with UJ who recreated what life was like in Kensington. I mean, we had kids from all areas of the GTA singing Yiddish songs in Kensington Market. So we, you have to make it fun for them. You have to make it interesting for them. And it's not just about learning. I mean, I'm very into experiential learning and having the experience, right? So maybe they don't even know that it's Jewish Heritage Month and maybe it's not that important to them. But in the meantime, uh, 4,000 kids from across the GTA walked into a synagogue for the first time during that, our Jewish Heritage Month uh, activity or project uh, two years ago. I think that's unbelievable. That's great. So we have just a few more minutes to go. I'm not seeing any other questions. My apologies to any that I lost. But I'm going to ask each of you to sort of conclude is what's the most important thing in terms of the goal or the impact that you want to have during Jewish Heritage Month? And um, maybe, Leora, you could um, kick that off. Um, I, I wanted to go back for, you know, the question about uh, how what happens in these incidents and I and how just to note that you know, Facing History has been seeing more, receiving more calls from principals around incidents. And so, you know, there's the anecdotal that we see the numbers and then there's, I can, you know, I, I can attest to the, the rise in, in anti-Semitism in, in schools because we're getting those phone calls from principals to come in um, and we're getting those phone calls to help the teachers, right? So the direct work with students is really, really important. And then how is Facing History coming in? How are we supporting the teachers to have those classrooms because that's where the students are really working this through. So to Corey's point also, you know, the teachers need to be prepared. Um, and, and I think that, so what's most important in Jewish Heritage Month is to focus on um, the, the life, the Jewish people. Um, it's wonderful, of course, as an organization, we want, we want people to be learning. I mean, my mission, our mission is to have young people through their teachers learn about the Holocaust. But in Jewish Heritage Month, it's about Jewish heritage. It's about the life. It's about the Jewish people. It's about resilience. It's about, and that is very much a part of a Holocaust, a study of the Holocaust and a study of anti-Semitism. But who are the people? What is the diversity of that people? And so Jewish Heritage Month in every way supports what we want to then see happening when students begin to learn about the Holocaust and the long history of anti-Semitism. So, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled when our classrooms actually, you know, engage with Jewish Heritage Month, looking at the diversity of Jewish life. 
Okay, thank you. Corey? I just want to actually further what Leora was saying where, you know, we talk about the Holocaust, we talk about the difficulties in the past, we talk about those up periods and down periods in Jewish history. And really, you know, and I agree with you 100%, Jewish Heritage Month is all about celebrating, um, you know, the Jewish contributions to Canada as a whole and how we're part of this great country and how we contributed and how we helped it to grow just as many other nations did and as many other peoples did, uh, which we see through the different heritage months throughout the year. Uh, but we don't experience this every day and we don't think about this every day. So this is really important that it gives us a chance to focus on this month amongst other you know, populations that we get to focus a little bit on, on what the Jewish contributions are. But when people say we can't or we shouldn't talk about the Holocaust or difficult pastimes, I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think we should focus on it this month. Um, I think we should always be, always be having that conversation because that's you know, a horrible point in history. Um, and it's something that should always be remembered. Um, you know, like George Santayana, he said, those who do not remember their past are condemned to repeat their mistakes. We don't want the world to repeat those mistakes. We want to learn from it. And we want to move forward. But it's part of what makes us who we are as a people. It's why we love our music so much. Mm -hmm. It's why we love our food so much. It's why we appreciate family so much because we've been through these hard times. We've been through these terrible moments in history as a people. And coming out the other side, we realize that, you know, you, you really need to grab life by the horns, enjoy it while you can, and celebrate who you are as a people. So I think just that part of it is really um, an indicator of how important it is to just celebrate who we are during Jewish Heritage Month. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I agree with you, Corey. Thank you for articulating <laughs> it in that way. Nicole, would you like to give us your thoughts about it? I have to say, when... Uh, the Canadian government mandated Jewish Heritage Month. I was so excited because my job has been quite negative since, you know, 2008. I focused on the worst of humanity and the Holocaust, right. anti-Semitism, and finally here is something where I, I feel like Jewish Canadians now can have an opportunity to showcase everything that our, um, our race and religion are about, and and be really proud of our heritage and what we've done in Canada as well as around the world. Um, and, you know, having, but understanding that uh, one, if there are a couple of things that the Jews do have in common. So education, family, and then unfortunately worrying about anti-Semitism. But for the rest of it, you know, you can't make stereotypes or mass generalizations and teaching that from a really young age, I think will, will go really far. But you have to actually remind students because by the time they graduate, they have a vague memory of, you know, grade six, out of grade 10. And so, yes, the, the Jewish Heritage Month will, I think, go far in hopefully preventing kids too from being drawn to the hate groups, which is, is a real concern today. Right. Thank you. Um, and Shari? I'm probably going to get this number wrong, but I think we have, we celebrated the board maybe 11 Heritage Months. We share, we share a Jewish Heritage Month with Asian Heritage Month. And, you know, I get to see in the classroom what it does for kids, right? Because if you're, if you learn about someone who's different from you, then you're not scared of that person. And that's what Jewish Heritage Month and all the Heritage Months mean at TDSB. Um, and we often come together in our Heritage Months. I love celebrating everything Jewish and I love celebrating it and teaching kids just an example, um, so we do sh share uh, Jewish Heritage Month with Asian, the Asian Heritage Month this year because of our commitment to Liberation 75. I didn't even know they were doing this, but they decided that the, the focus of Asian Heritage Month would be on um, certain Asians who assisted, who were righteous Gentiles during the Holocaust, such as, you know, Chuni Sugihara, and that's what they did in the classroom. And that's the joining together of two heritage, heritage groups, and I think that's pretty beautiful. So. It's all about I'm something. delighted to hear that. I yeah. think that is fantastic. As right. someone who has two Asian Jewish children, I would love to know that there is some joining together. Um, and, and on the other side, I think that um, within the Jewish educational system, we need to do more to teach that diversity too. A few years ago, I introduced the idea that when we have Black History Month, the Jewish schools should do Black Jewish history because they often choose to do nothing. So I think that there's a great opportunity to do crossovers on both sides. 
If you watch Max Eisen's liberation video, which uh, Marilyn provided for me at Liberation 75, he talks about being liberated from Evansy concentration camp by the 761st Battalion of the US Army, which was a black unit, you know, highly segregated. And um, his longtime friendship with the commander of the unit, and you know, he doesn't use the word shared oppressions, but that's sort of the theme. I showed that, that clip to so many of the black principals in our system and they were blown away and they thought our, our students need to see this. I was blown away. I didn't know about the 761st. This is um, a shared heritage that we have with, with the African Heritage Committee and uh, I want to do more of that at the TDSB. Great. Shared learning, shared yeah. appreciation. That's awesome. I, I want to thank all four of you. This has been wonderful. I've learned a lot. I'm really looking forward to digging into more of what your organizations do and, and getting to know you. So thank you so much for doing this on behalf of Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation. Tomorrow we have a webinar at, um, at noon on dealing with anti-Semitism in the United Kingdom. So I hope those of you that are available will join us. And I wish everybody a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know.